All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I have a very interesting guest here with me today. We've met uh, a couple of years ago now um, when Lisa was still teaching, but I have here with me, obviously, uh, Lisa Zamet. Zamet? Is that, that, Zamet, that, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Zamet? Okay. Um, Lisa is here with me today to talk about a not so controversial, very controversial topic. We'll be talking about the issue of medical abortion. Um, but before we get into that issue, uh, Lisa, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, maybe your background as a health professional, your teaching career, all that good stuff. Okay. Well, um, I started life um, in surgery. I thought that was all I was ever going to do was operate until I fell over. Um, I started, I got a job as a kid as an OR tech. And um, that was way back when where you could walk in and say, hey, I have a pulse and they put you to work. <laughs> um, and so I started working as an OR tech and altered my college career so that I could do whatever it took to keep me in that OR. I just loved it. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't afford to go surgeon route. So um, I actually entered a program called the Surgeon Assistant Program at University of Alabama in Birmingham. And that's like a physician assistant, which is what I am now. But um, it specifies surgery. So everything we did was surgery oriented. Graduated in 82 and then didn't work surgery until the very end of my career. Uh, just because there were hard, jobs were hard to find and, you know, a bunch of other stuff, family, kids, moving, et cetera. Um, when we moved to Savannah with my husband at the time, um, I got a job and I've worked multiple different careers. And that's the thing I love about being a PA is I can do pretty much anything. I've, I've worked in surgery. I've worked in research, urgent care, emergency medicine, uh, head and neck, reconstructive, all kinds of fun things. And so I got a job and started working and um, realized that, hey, you're getting old and 10 hours a day in surgery is just not going to work for you anymore. So I started a gradual transition over to academia, um, mm -hmm. got my master's as um, in master's of um, health science from George Washington University. And there is where I started concentrating on what the problem was with why we were having so much trouble communicating with patients and why were patients seeming to just, you know, ignore what we were trying to tell them. And especially when I was working as a hospitalist with end of life issues, why are, you know, I, I can tell you numerous horror stories of where I've like actually had to call the cops to keep family members separated uh, in ICU rooms, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually concentrated my studies on communication issues and how to mm -hmm. tell people they're going to die and how to help them in that transition, particularly when they're working with family members. So that's how I started kind of transitioning into academia was teaching that and surgery to South University physician assistants. Uh, people kept telling us, uh, my friend uh, was a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she basically taught me systems theory uh, mm -hmm. without going into the deep end. But people kept telling us we ought to write a book. And so more years than I want to think about, uh, at least 10 <laughs> years ago, we, we said, well, okay, well, let's write a book. And so we finally got it published, and I'll show you a picture of it. This yeah. is it, and it's relational care, improving health care, uh, communication and health care. And it's basically just you know, teaching clinicians that there's more than just, you know, when I, when I was growing up way back when, you know, there was just the disease, you know, and you cut on it and you fix it and then you move on. Well, there's other players in that equation. And if we don't recognize them, we don't have to understand them. We don't have to control them for crying out loud. We definitely don't want to control them, but we want to respect them and we want to listen to them. Um, and if we can do that, there's less likely to be conflict. And if so, if there is conflict, we give some hints on how to, how to manage conflict. Hmm. So. And I will uh, provide a link in the description of this video to Lisa's book, if Sweet. you are interested. So, yeah. So what, um, I, I'm wondering if you can explain kind of the, because medicine's confusing for a lot of people, uh, even very well educated people. I mean, it's confusing for, us, for it's me. Confusing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, where does a physician's assistant kind of fit into that 
medical hierarchy and maybe for some of my students that are listening that are possibly interested in this as a career like what would be some kind of the, the steps that a person would take to become a physician's assistant okay the easiest way to explain it and this is how i used to tell my patients all the time is you know you have a doctor and you have everybody else below right i mean and at the very bottom is patient care techs or you know um, uh, medical assistance, et cetera. Um, I, I am a physician assistant, which allows me to do pretty much anything a doc does, as long as a doc comes along and signs my charts and says, yes, I agreed with that, you know, type of thing. So, um, I have not operated on somebody without direct supervision, but I have opened and I have closed a patient. I have, uh, in, in the OR, I write admit orders, I write discharge orders. Um, I can do pretty much anything a doc does as long as the doc's event, some, some doc that is my direct supervising physician comes along and says, you know, countersigns off on it and says, yes, this was correct. And I agree 100% with this. So um, it's more than a scribe. Um, I'm actually doing things. I'm actually starting therapies. Um, I have, you know, I've coded people, I've delivered babies. I never want to do that again. That's <laughs> not my jam. Um, uh, and you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, and, and the nice thing about it is most docs have a lot of, um, business, uh, responsibilities. So they have to manage a practice. They have to be part of the management team of a practice. They have to deal with, you know, all the paperwork involved in that. All I have to do is the medicine, which is exactly what I wanted to do. I just wanted to play in the medicine. So um, it's it's the best. And like I said, I'm kind of like a squirrel. I have ADD. Um, you know, after I've done surgery for a while, I'm just like, well, this is really cool. What can I go do something else that's different? And usually a job floats along. And I'll go, oh, man, ER, that sounds awesome. Let's go play there. So um I am addicted to in-hospital medicine. I, I've done outpatient only at gunpoint. Don't like it. Uh, I like having access to all the toys and the mm -hmm. bells and whistles. So, um, you know, it's it's a cool jam. It really is. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that my students have always said is, you know, you really are passionate about it. And I was like, to me, it's the most fun job at all, of all. You know, um, mm -hmm. if I had if I had a functional body and... I'm gradually working on replacement parts for everything. I would still be doing it. So um, I love it. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. Well, that was a very uh, enthusiastic support of the field. So <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's great. Um, so let's transition here to the topic of abortion. Um, so at, at the time of the recording of this video, the United States Supreme Court has overturned the ruling of Roe versus Wade. So abortion is, uh, I think it would be an understatement to say that it's a hot topic right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to approach this primarily from, to get your medical expertise here, primarily from a medical standpoint. So let's start off at the very bottom basic level. Um, maybe tell us what as in as broad as terms as possible what is abortion maybe what are some different types of abortion and we'll start from there okay well the the i'm, I'm scrolling through my notes just so i make sure i don't convince uh uh goof up my abortion definitions so abortion in medicine means the death of a fetus now, a lot of people think that abortion is only for convenience. So, and, you know, a woman no longer wants to be pregnant for whatever reason whatsoever. She goes to a clinic and she has an abortion. Um, unfortunately, in medicine, anytime there is a death of the fetus, we, you know, we term that an abortion. And the general public views someone losing a fetus you know, unintentionally wanted a child and now she's lost it. We call, they, the general public calls that miscarriage. 
we do not use miscarriage in um, medical parlance, okay? It's always an abortion. It's an abortion of some type. And we have several different types, and those types are also broken down. So I'm just going to go through them real quick, and I've got my notes over here. That's why I'm looking. So yeah. threatened threatened abortion is when the fetus is threatening to uh, abort, spontaneously abort. Um, and we can see that um, throughout uh, the pregnancy and for various numerous, numerous reasons. And then the question becomes is, is this fetus going to be able to survive outside of the uterus or is it going to be able to, are we going to be able to slow that process down so that the, the fetus can come to term is our, is our term for it, you know, or is this fetus damaged in some kind of way that's making um, viability outside the womb impossible. So that's threatened abortion. Then there's missed abortions. And we see a lot of these, and this is becoming a problem with um, some women that we're seeing in certain states, is the fetus has died. And, and so, but the body doesn't really know it. And so it's maintaining um, the lining of the uterus, and it's pretending that the fetus is still, things are still going on, even though the fetus is dead. There is no way that child is going to be born normal, healthy, alive. So the fetus is dead, and so the woman is carrying toxic tissue because this thing, you know, at, at the risk of grossing people out, this thing is starting to rot inside of her uterus, okay? And so what happens with that one is that as that decomposition happens, the woman can become septic, and she can become very, very sick very, very fast, like within... 10, 12 hours. She can go from walking around, walking, talking, doing everything. She's not maybe not feeling great, but still, yeah, walking around to on a ventilator trying to die. So that's one of the reasons that why uh, missed abortions are a big deal. There's a spontaneous abortion, which usually happens. And there's some studies out there that say up to 60% of, um, uh, pregnancies end in a spontaneous abortion where the fetus dies, the, the contents of the uterus are expelled. So it's a spontaneous abortion where the woman just gets rid of the, uter uh, the fetus. And a lot of times that'll happen within the first trimester. A lot of times the woman thinks, oh, she's only a week or two late. And she just, you know, she was a week or two late for, for whatever reason. That was actually probably an aborted fetus. Um, Sometimes now with spontaneous, we can we can term them as either complete or incomplete. Um, again, incomplete um, uh, missed abortions of uh, spontaneous abortions can also be dangerous because products of conception, and that's a medical term, products uh, residual products from that pregnancy can be retained, and again cause sepsis because it's it's dead tissue that's retained for whatever reason and the woman's uterus does not expel it. Most of the time when we when we do an abortion with that, um, we call that a DNC, dilation and curatage, where we literally just scrape out everything that's in there in the uterus that's not supposed to be in there anymore. Um, and so again, that's a term that we use that kind of gets confusing because you know, is it an abortion? Yes. Well, kind of, sort of. You know, um, it's it's a spontaneous abortion that caused, you know, retained products that forces us to do a DNC. So that can be confusing. And then, um, then there's therapeutic, and that's when um, it's medically indicated that the, the woman, for save the life of the mother, the fetus must be aborted. Or it's medically indicated because the fetus is so damaged, it's no longer viable, and it's going to cause a drain on the mother's health and, and her own health and safety. And so we go ahead and therapeutically abort that child before it kills her. Um, we see that a lot in patients with pregnancy. Um, we also see it in, uh, in vitro fertilization. Um, because with in vitro fertilization, we want to implant somewhere between six and eight embryos in the hopes that two or three will implant and catch and, and take. But sometimes we have women that implant um, eight embryos and women are not designed to safely deliver eight babies. Um, so we usually electively uh, abort um, somewhere between three and four of them. 
uh, which is a problem. And then finally, there's a uh, convenience. And it's an abortion due to convenience. And this is the term that most of the general public believes abortion is, that all abortions are abortion for convenience. I got pregnant. I don't want the kid, so I'm going to abort it. So it's it's very, very complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it. So given... Um, I think part of the complication here is in the medical world, you just listed off uh, yes. five definitions of different types of abortions. But in common terminology, when it's talked about within the context of politics, we're just using this big umbrella term, abortion, right? Yeah. So how, and I don't, you know, best guess here, how common how often is this an issue? How often are abortions? Is this something that you see on a regular basis within a clinical setting? How often do women who are trying to get pregnant or have been pregnant go through this? Um, well, I mean, you know, I can tell you that um, in, um, I have three living children and I've had at least one abortion. Uh, it was a spontaneous abortion. Um, I was literally waiting until the next week to before I got my pregnancy test because I was pretty sure I was pregnant and then I spontaneously started. I, you know, again, there is a guesstimate because we don't keep numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. So we don't know specifically and when, well, uh, how many abortions per state are, you know, all we have is guesstimates because each state, each region can voluntarily decide not to report on abortion numbers or they can report abortion numbers. And again, each state can decide what type of abortion numbers they want to uh, report. Do they want to report all of the abortions that occur in this region or do they only want to report, you know, the medically induced abortions? Do they want to report only things from Planned Parenthoods? We don't have numbers. We don't have specific numbers. Um, it's kind of like what we're seeing now with COVID, you know, because nobody's testing anymore. So we don't really know what's out there. We're just kind of guessing based on the number of people that are showing up at the hospital. That's not that's that's pretty crummy data from what we you know what we're used to seeing. So we don't really know. I mean, I um, and a lot of times when um, the coding is done for, let's say, when I went in. So when I went in to have my DNC because of my missed abortion. It was just coded as a missed abortion, but that number was very generic. It did not, it, when it when you look up the coding, it just says abortion. It didn't say missed abortion. It didn't say abortion for convenience. It didn't say therapy. It just said abortion, DNC for abortion. And that was it. That was the only thing that was in the coding on my bill. So that's the only thing, if that was reported in that state at, on that year, that was the only thing that went to the CDC. Now, we do have a few numbers. Um, the Pregnancy Mortality Surveillance System was implemented in 1969. Uh, last available data shows that 195 abortions per 100,000 live births in 2019. Um, and this was only in 49 reporting areas. And the total was um, basically 630,000 abortions. Again, can't tell you why those abortions were done. They may have been, you know, a missed abortion like mine. They could have been done for other medical reasons or they could have been done con for convenience, but we just don't know. There's another uh, group out there that does um, abortion tracking, but again, the reporting to that group is voluntarily voluntary um, and it's a right to life. And so it's not a scientifically based reporting system. So I, I didn't even include it in my numbers or my estimates because I, who knows? I mean, they could just be using a dartboard for that. Um, I did not spend, I'll be honest, I didn't spend a lot of time researching that to see how viable they were. But, um, you know, we just don't have good data. Mm. Okay. So let's, um, let's complicate it even further. <laughs> right? So tell us about, um, you know, about Roe v. Wade, big picture, but also maybe you can tell us a little bit about the impact that Roe versus Wade had in the medical community and the impact that it had 
for uh, women's health specifically. Okay. So this is where it gets really complicated. Um, and the reason why it gets so terribly complicated is that, um, you know, uh, I was doing some research and thinking about a paper one at one point. And, you know, we have three definitions for death. Very simple, you know, cardiopulmonary cessation. They stop breathing and they stop fogging up the mirror. That's That's been around since for millennia, literally. Then we have um, uh, total brain failure, which is brain dead. They're completely and totally brain dead. EEG is totally flat lound. And now we have something called neocortical death, which means that everything that makes you a human being uh, is gone. So your heart's still beating. Your lungs may or may not be spontaneously um, you know, breathing for you. Your temperature regulation, and that's all due to the hind brain, the very back part of your brain. Uh, the, we also call it the reptilian brain, the very basic part of the brain. But the front part of the brain, that's the neocortical death, the cortex, uh, the cerebellum, the part that makes you a reasoning, thinking, walking, talking human being is gone. Okay. And the reason why we have those three definitions is um, to allow for organ transplant because we can't kill somebody to save somebody else. So we, we term them as neocortical dead so we can harvest the organs and use those organs to save somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, so that's when a person's soul, and this is where it really gets uh, confusing. That's when a person no longer is a human being. That's when their brain dies and they become basically a bag of meat, okay, to, to be very crude about it. Um, we don't know when ensoulment occurs when a fetus is conceived, okay? So Roe v. Wade, so the government really doesn't care that much about fetuses. They care more about taxpayers, okay? So that's what this is all about is, you know, are you killing a potential taxpayer or a potential voter for my party? So, you know, um, so the problem with it is, is when does a, a fetus have a soul? And we don't know that. Um, there was one person that did research, and I meant to drag her name up, and I forgot to do it, um, that did a research paper on when does the term ensoulment, when does a fetus become a human being? And according to cultures and religious uh, value systems, there's over 300 versions of when a fetus becomes a human being. Mm -hmm. There's everything from when a man and woman decide they want to have coitus which is a little premature in my book, but you know, whatever, <laughs> uh, to uh, three years of age, because a lot of Aboriginal uh, tribes do not recognize children until they've made it past three years of age because of um, infant mortality. And so there's this huge range in between of times of when, based upon your religion and your cultural mores and your technology and your availability of care and everything, you decide that a human being, a uh, human being is made. Okay. And they're no longer just a bunch of cells, but actually a human being. So the answer is, we don't know. We don't have a scientific test. We don't have a blood test. We can't uh, determine that. That is determined by religious mores. So the Supreme Court, when you lo actually look at Roe versus Wade, they were like, man, we really don't want to mess with this. We, you know, this has the ultimate, this can be a hot mess and we really don't want to mess with this. And so they kind of wanted to, to, they wanted to run away from it. So, um, and so, but you know, the, the Texas abortion ban, which was, um, um, uh, created the, uh, let me pull this up, the numbers here, because I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at numbers, believe it or not. So although the medical profession didn't want to just go around aborting babies like crazy, we also recognize the fact that women are going to abort, um, whether they want to abort or they're going to spontaneously abort, they are going to need care because they have aborted. And so the medical profession generally does not recommend abortion. We believe that it's damaging for the women as far as their physical health, but also their mental health. So, but we also recognize that there are women desperate enough that they will abort to the point where they'll do anything to abort. Okay. And there's always situations where, you know, uh, for instance, the Ohio case that just came up, 
um, uh, where the 10, 10 year old or 12, I can't remember, very, very young child was pregnant and she could not get an abortion in Ohio. So she had to travel to, I think it was Indiana to get the abortion there. Um, what they don't say and what they normally don't talk about because it's you know uncomfortable is when you see a child who has been sexually abused and used in that way, most of the time that's a family member. So not only are you looking at, you know, a pregnancy on a, a child, uh, child pregnancy, but you're also looking at incest and the results of incest. So, you know, you know, so we see those things and, you know, your wife sees those things. I know she can tell you that, but she probably won't. I mean, we don't talk about it that much because it's painful. So, you know, when you see those types of things, we know that there's times when abortions have to be done. Um, by 1971, there was elective uh, abortions um, on, available on demand in specific states, kind of like what we have right now with Roe v. Wade being overturned. But by in 1900, almost every state had some form of an abortion law, and they weren't really very. That was very amorphous. It was very ill-defined. One state was just like, you know, you're the least bit pregnant. You know, you have to be protected. You can never have an abortion, yada, yada. Or it's, you know, come to California and we'll give you an abortion right away, you know, type of thing. So it was very amorphous. And so um, the rationale behind uh, banning elective abortions was to protect fetal life, protect the life of the mother, deterrence for future abortions, and to avoid injury to future reproductive attempts. So every time um, abortion occurs, there is a risk for scar, and the scar can cause uh, it to be more difficult for you to have uh, a pregnancy later in life. So again, that was a whole bunch of amorphous you know, stuff um, that was made up by a lot of politicians who honestly didn't know what they were talking about because they weren't seeing the results of you know, uh, coat hanger abortions in the emergency rooms. They weren't seeing, you know, uh, septic shock due to the fact that these kids were going to backstreet areas and getting abortions. So um, that was that was a biggest problem. So literally what happens with Roe v. Wade was in um, 73, 1973, the Texas abortion ban was based on, on the concept that life began at the moment of conception. Again, a religious construct. You know, we don't know when life actually begins. So um, the fetus is a person with the right to life, and it was ruled unconstitutional based upon the right of the woman's right to privacy. OK, so in other words, the Supreme Court said having a child may force the woman up into a distressful life and future, uh, distressful life and future. Um, being forced to carry an unwanted pregnancy may bring psychological harm. Caring for the child is a burden, both financial, mental, physical, every which way there is. Um, and the stress on the woman, family, and the child may be extreme. And so the court refused. The court was just like, we're not going to find when life begins. Okay, we, we ain't going to go there because we realize what a mess and a pit that's going to be. But what we the court did, and this was something that always surprises me, when I first heard about it, um, I didn't realize that the court created the trimester construct, okay? It's mm. not based on medicine. So the first trimester is when abortion carries less medical risk. So we do know that, but um, it, the court just said, okay, so if it's in the first trimester, it's unrestricted. You can have abortion anytime you want, Okay. From the second trimester on, the risk to the mother and to the fetus escalates. And so, therefore, the abortion uh, was restricted unless the mother's life was in danger in any way, shape, or form. And in the third trimester, the state's kind of like, hey, wait, this is a little taxpayer. We want to keep him alive, him, and she, him, him or her alive. And so we want to take fetal life, the fetal life taxpayer voter takes precedence unless the mother's life is in extreme danger. OK, so it's the reason why it's so amorphous was the court was trying to create a construct of a legal decision based upon, you know, gee whiz guess and mm -hmm. a little bit of medicine. And let's not talk about the uh, religious aspect of this. <laughs> so they mm -hmm. danced. They danced. And it's not, you know, overturning Roe v. Wade. In my personal opinion, 
is not a bad thing per se because it's very amorphous, ill-defined, but we need to replace it with something better. And we can't leave it like it is right now because women, I can tell you right now that, you know, there are women that are suffering. They're trying to decide whether or not they're going to try an abortion on them on by themselves, on themselves. We're going to lose both woman and child. Um, and so I don't know how, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're wealthy enough to be able to travel, you can go somewhere. But what about the person who can't, who has to be at work the very next day or else the rest of her family doesn't get fed or she doesn't get fed or she gets thrown out on the street or she already is living on the street and she needs an abortion because there's no way she can bear that child. Um, you know, it's, it's a serious issue. We cannot leave it the way it is right now. We just cannot because we're going to see a lot of people die. And we've already seen a lot of people die in the past two weeks, uh, past two years needlessly. So we don't need to add to that body count. So, Mm. so yeah, that, that kind of transitions to the second aspect of this that I wanted to talk about, which was, um, what do you see, what what do you think? And this is hypothetical, a little bit of a speculation going on here, but because we're still so close to Roe v. Wade being overturned. What do you think are, is going to be the consequence of this? Um, what might potentially be some of the uh, negative consequences of Roe v. Wade being overturned? And then maybe what do you think should replace it or how do we fix it? Or where do we go from here type thing? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, okay, so at the risk of offending people, I, you know, I think that when politicians try to create uh, a yes or no black or white and, and an ethical dilemma, um, like what we're talking about with abortion, um, they're just going to make it worse, okay? So personally, I believe that the way... Um, and, and I've talked to a lot of clinicians, um, not many lawyers, but a lot of clinicians about this. And I would love to get your opinion of it is that, you know, when life begins is a religious and moral and cultural determination. Mm-hmm. And so the court saying that first trimester, a kid's not a human being, that's the court imposing their religion upon me personally. So I view Roe v. Wade and the overturn of Roe v. Wade, the question of abortion is um, is an infringement upon, you know, division of church and state. You can't tell me, so uh, you can't tell me when my child is my child, okay? I may believe that my first trimester. I may believe that only after the baby has been delivered. That is my right. And and what I believe is between me and my God. Okay. So the court saying, well, we're not gonna we're gonna force you to carry this child to term because um, you know, that's what we believe is the child is a human being, the fetus is a human being. That's the court and the state imposing it's religious mores upon me. So that's that's my viewpoint. I think Roe v. Wade is not going to be reinstated. I think we what we need to do is have a national law through Congress that states that, you know, um, that, and I don't know how to do that because now I'm talking, you know, something right. that I'm not comfortable with, that's but it right. states that a woman's rights are a woman's rights. And what she believes is the status of her fetus is between her, the fetus and her God. And we have no right to trump on that. Hmm. I would like to know what you think. I don't know if it's going to be, <laughs> I don't want to be in front of the Supreme Court arguing, arguing <laughs> this, but uh, that's what I believe. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's something that I've thought about. I think everybody's been thinking about it over the last few months, especially. But um, I mean, I think you're right to point out that a lot of these arguments and conversations are rooted in um, preconceived religious or philosophical ideas that aren't shared by everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to determine when personhood begins um, or when the 
the the soul, right? We don't have a, a soul reader. Right? So, oh yeah, there's a soul in the baby now. Or a personhood reader that says, oh yeah, that lump of cells is now a, a person. And oftentimes how we define person is, is rooted in some sort of um, religious fr framework as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it's a hard question, which is why I wanted to ask you. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Tag your head. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I guess my big concern here is um, so that, that is a legitimate question. Uh, it, it's a, it's a really big question, um, that I don't think we can just like ignore, but it, it seems like we have to balance that question with issues and questions of, uh, how to phrase it, like the, the mother's, the mother's rights, not to phrase this as some sort of like pro-life versus pro-choice type situation. But I think we also have to, to uh, and this is what I want to, another kind of follow-up question that I wanted to ask you to kind of frame the, the medical conversation is, so we have the question about the fetus and when the fetus becomes a person, but then there's this other question about um, what a woman should medically have be available to her what can be available to her, what ought to be available to her. Um, and the reason why I'm asking this is because what we're also starting to see is the criminalization of abortion, mm -hmm. right? So that's the the other dynamic. I'm more than happy to talk about like the, when, <laughs> when the person, when personhood begins and what personhood is. Um, but I kind of see those things as two separate conversations if that makes i don't know if that makes sense perfectly it makes it makes but the the problem that the medical aspect of it is is you can't ask a medical provider to decide that hmm. right there you know when so if um one of the most striking things that happened to me and i've kind of already halfway alluded to this was when I was born and raised Southern Baptist. So man, I was just like, you know, smoking is bad, dancing bad, drinking bad, every, you know, everything was bad, you know, type of thing. And when I was a college, um, a college freshman, um, I saw one of my dorm mates rolled out of the dorm room and she was in, I didn't know it at the time, but I, you know, it, it so burned itself into my brain. I now realize she was in septic shock and basically in a condition so, um, where she was bleeding to death uh, from attempting a court, coat hanger abortion on herself. We lost two people that day. And, and I can remember going into my dorm room and just laying on my bed going, how is that better? You know, this kid had no other option in her, in her brain you know, and that was way back when, I mean, that's 50 years ago. That was way back when, where, you know, I was in a small college town. She had no options, no connections, no. And so she felt like this was her only choice was to an attempt to coat hanger abortion on herself. That's not right either. And I don't, and I've seen other women who have had complications due to abortions that were medically performed. Um, childbirth is not simple. Um, you know, childbirth can be life threatening and it can be very life threatening very quickly. Um, so can abortions be uh, a serious issue. And so when I'm faced with that kind of question, I don't want to have to go through the philosophical dilemma of, you know, determining whether or not this woman is mentally competent to raise a child determining whether or not, you know, X, Y, or Z. I've got enough decisions on saving that life and trying to preserve the fetus if I can. Most of the time I cannot. Uh, when, they, when it presents to my emergency room, most of the time things have progressed to the point where, you know, we're just trying to save mom and that's it. Um, on the flip side of that, I've had, I had a couple that when they told their parents that they were pregnant. They were teenagers. They were in high school. And I'll never forget, I took care of this kid. We called him Sharky because he was a crib shark. Um, he was born with a medical condition. It was very easily reversed in the hospital, 
but because the couple had been thrown out of both their both parents, both sets of parents had thrown them out of the house, they were living in a car in the lake, at the lake. And that's the lake was there basically or the bathroom. They could bathe in the lake. They got their water from the lake. We could not discharge Sharky to the couple, even though the couple wanted him. They came and visited as often as they could. You know, we knew the parents. The, the kids were really cute kids. The parents would didn't have, want to have anything to do with either child or the baby. OK, this kid had been in the hospital in Birmingham for um, I think it was 18 months going on two years. And, you know, he was living in the hospital at, because we couldn't give him away. The parents wanted him. We could not get him into foster care. Uh, the, the grandparents didn't want to have anything to do. You know, that child is permanently scarred. The nurses decided they wanted to take him outside one day just because he had never been outside. And they took him outside. And as soon as he hit the outside air, he totally flipped out. They had to bring him back in. And, to, you know, get him calmed down again because he'd never, this child had never been outside. He'd been in a hospital room all of his life. That child is permanently damaged too. You know, we've got enough problems. The medical community has enough problems on our hands. Please don't make us judge and jury over whether or not that woman is psychologically impaired and therefore qualifies for an abortion versus this woman is perfectly capable of delivering a baby and she just wants a, uh, an abortion for convenience. Don't make us decide that. We've got enough nightmares on our hands. And so, and, and we're the ones that are in the front line and the politicians are trying to parse out, you know, you're going to go to jail if you do this, but it's okay if you do that. You know, that's not going to work either. So we've got to, we've got to give, in my viewpoint, we've got to give the power back to the woman because, again, it goes back to her morality and her her sense of mores. Do I want to perform an abortion? No, not really. I view life as precious. But there's there's providers out there that want to safely provide abortions to women who feel like they need to have one, and I feel like that's necessary as well. Mm. Yeah, we we had a physician that in cases of rape. Um, because of his religion, would not write for the morning after pill. But what he did was when we had a, a rape case come into our emergency room, he would literally just stick the prescription in the paperwork and then just silently slide that, that chart over to a physician who would sign that, that order for him. He could not sign it. In his personal belief system, he could not sign it. We respected that and we signed it for him every time. And, you know, it's just like you do what you you do you and you bear the consequences of you doing you. So that's that's kind of what I believe. Hmm. As ill-defined as that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's really hard to be to give specifics in cases like that. Um, I'm, I was also curious and I don't know if you've come across this yet. Um, because again, all this is still very, very new, but I'm wondering how this would affect, um, and Summer and I were talking about this the other day, because I, I think it was, um, so my wife's a, a nurse, by the way, I don't know if I've said that on this YouTube channel before, um, she had to do some sort of training and it was, and I can't remember what it's for, cause I'm not in the medical field. So all that stuff's <laughs> over my head, but it was talking about um, it was it was they had to revise the training model module because of Roe v. Wade being overturned, and it had to do with and maybe you can enlighten me here. It was a situation in which a mother comes in, something goes wrong, and this also heavily 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 depends on the state. All right, and that. Mm -hmm. Right, but some states now are are passing legislation that would potentially criminalize an abortion, and healthcare providers could potentially be at risk for performing an abortion. Um, and in this situation specifically, when the woman came in and it was a pregnant woman, and when her life was in danger, um, it was basically forcing the whoever was there and responsible for her to immediately make a choice, right? 
Yeah. Who are you going to save? Yeah. It, right? I mean, it, and I have, thankfully, I have not been directly clinically involved in that kind of a decision. Um, but I've had those types of patients in the hospitals where I've worked, where we knew that was going on, that that struggle was occurring. Um, uh, most commonly, especially when I, um, in the earlier years, now, now, thankfully, things have changed a little bit to where it's not nearly as much of a um, serious issue, although it still comes up in certain types of cancers, is when a mother is diagnosed with cancer and the chemo is going to kill the baby, you know, or, you know, or, or horribly, horribly damage the inf the fetus. Um, and so generally the decision is made to go ahead and abort the fetus um, just because the chemo is just going to be so destructive if the infant, if the fetus experiences anything, um, then it's going to be pain. Um, we've also had patients where a woman has had massive medical trauma. I mean, excuse me, uh, physical trauma like a uh, motor vehicle accident. Um, exsanguinated. This was actually occurred in a facility um, where I worked um, and I was involved in the medical ethics board. Um, she had massive trauma. She had essentially exsanguinated, basically lost all of her blood supply twice in the first night um, and had had multiple surgeries, was facing many, many more surgeries and probably four to six months in um, basically a um, rehab facility if she was ever going to walk again, if she survived everything that was wrong with her. She was also four months pregnant. Oh. And so, you know, the question was, was, was the fetus even viable because she had exsanguinated? She literally bled to death on the table twice during, you know, I think she took something like 35 units of blood the first night. I mean, it was just absolutely horrific injuries. And this developing fetus was going to be yet another physiological drain on her throughout this prolonged recovery if she survived the first month of the trauma, because that was really up in the air. She had closed head trauma, you name it. She pretty much had everything going on. So the question was, was whether or not to go ahead and abort or not. Um, the husband was involved. Um, obviously, and wanted his wife to survive, but also wanted the child to live as well. And so, I mean, it's a heart rendering. I mean, just absolutely one of those things that keeps you up all night thinking about, you know, what's the best thing? How do we find our way out of this? Um, again, you know, in vitro fertilization, what's going to happen to those clinicians when a woman has eight to 10 implanted fetuses and is the size of your lovely wife, who's a tiny little girl. I mean, there's no way she's going to be able to bring 10 pregnancies to term safely. Somebody is going to die, you know, if not everybody. So um, putting clinicians in this position is horrific. And I think what's going to happen is as the states try to um, refine that law, so, you know, Places like Texas, Florida, and Ohio already have already have uh, cases in the national news where abortion is an issue, and it's in the national news. And so, as they try and parse this out, and as they try and well, it's okay if you've got this going on, but it's not okay if you've got that going on. And if they try and divide that law up and stuff, physicians, specifically OBGYNs, are going to say. I don't want to be part of this at all. And so what I think is going to happen is you're going to see a brain drain. They're going to say, mm -hmm. I just don't want to practice here anymore because I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to tell a mother that I'm sorry, you're going to have to die because we have to carry this child to term and it's going to put your life at risk. Mm -hmm. They're not going to want to do that. That's not what they're, that's not why they became physicians. They became physicians, clinicians to save life and to take care of people. And so they're going to say, well, if you don't let me do what I want to do, I'll just go someplace else. And so I think what you're going to see is maybe not right away. They're probably just kind of from what I'm seeing on my websites and stuff like, you know, uh, clinician chat rooms and stuff like that. People are like, you know, this really sucks. I hope somebody wises up sooner or later. Let's see what the midterm show us, that kind of stuff. Um, but I think eventually they're either just going to quit. I mean, they're tired from COVID already, mm -hmm. you know this is just not worth it. Let's go flip burgers somewhere or something like that. 
or, you know, they're going to go to a different state and you're going to see a brain drain and then you're going to see a drop in population because of that. So I think that the states are going to pay the price for that. Um, mm. It's scary. I, frankly, yes. I, it concerns me. Right. Yeah, that is that's um, very disturbing to to think about. Um, and I, I hate to leave it on that note. <laughs> 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 kind of dystopian nightmare. Um, so, uh, Lisa, tell us, I ask everyone at the end of the interview um, what sort of resources they would recommend if somebody's, let's say somebody's interested in becoming a physician's assistant or if somebody's interested in learning more about the medical side of abortion. Um, what are some books, articles, YouTube channels, websites, whatever that you would point somebody to? Well, uh, believe it or not, despite the, the bad rap it's gotten, uh, the CDC has a very, very good uh, abortion and abortion statistic page um, that describes the different types of abortion. It's very good, very easy to read, takes you basically by hand through it. Um, uh, Medscape, I don't know if y'all were familiar with that uh, website as well, but it's also very, very good. Um, and that's basically what I'll I did a little, a lot of my research on is just to go back through. Um, you can just type in Roe versus Wade. I mean, even just plain old Wikipedia, as much as everybody, you know, fusses about it and everything else, it gives you a good basic generic understanding of the vocabulary and resources to dive into. If you want to, I'm, I'm very much, you know, I, I call it data mining. I go into the bibliography and references list and pop in through that and, you can get real deep real fast. And it's, you know, the problem again is I don't know much about legal um, and it gets very legal very quick. And I'm just sitting there going, you're not even speaking English anymore. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm much more comfortable in the medicine aspect of it. Hmm. Um, as far as physician assistant, just type um, uh, American Association of Physician Assistants has an excellent website for prospective members um, and for, you know, candidates for schools and stuff. I will tell you, having been in academia for 11 years, if you read about what a physician assistant does and what we can do and, you know, how all the different types of uh, specialty fields we can work in. I mean, um, I literally read about a physician assistant in one of my major professors alumni magazine. And I, I opened up the magazine. And I went, oh, my gosh, this is what I want. I'll, you know, whatever it takes, I'll do it. Um, but. Um, you know, the AAPA has some great resources. If you really want to do this, don't be surprised if you can't get in the first year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is, it's a marathon. It is not, you know, oh, I'll just walk in with my little high school degree and boom, I can walk right in. Most of the time, most of our uh, students have to apply an average of three uh, times to, before they can get in. Um, and the reason why is the school where I taught, we actually had fairly large class. We had 70 seats. On average, we had over 3,000 applications Oof. for those 70 seats. Of those 3,000, 1,500 met the metrics that our students, that, that our school accepted. So we, mm -hmm. on average, would uh, interview 1,000 to 1,200 to fill those 50, uh, those 70 seats. So the competition is fierce. I mean, absolutely incredibly fierce. So if, if you're interested, look at the schools, always base your school choice on pants rates. That's the physician assistance national certification exam. Um, if they have a good pants rate, pass rate for their pants, they're a school that's viable, okay? And for an option for you. Look at their website. They're very explicit because we've got so many applicants. We don't want more applicants. We just want the dedicated ones. So look at what you know each school's webpage says about what it takes to become a PA. Read about it. Find preferably somebody that you can talk to that is a PA, shadow a PA. Um, learn about it before you jump into it because it is... Um, it's kind of like an addiction. <laughs> uh, it really is. <laughs> and uh, if you don't have it, if you if you're not, I mean, if you look at the if you look at the pay rate, it's very good pay. Okay, mm. I'll be honest. But if that's the only reason you want to become a PA, you ain't gonna make it. 
Okay, because you know, PA school will suck, recertification will suck, you know, everything that you do will suck. So, but if you look at it and go, oh my God, this is the best thing ever, then we want you. So mm -hmm. don't give up. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Lisa, for taking time out of your day to talk to me.